Awesome. I'm really, really stoked to be here uh, in Paris. I didn't think I would be uh, talking about Go when I just started like a year ago. Um, it's awesome seeing just how the community has formed to see that there's such a huge representation in Europe. Have you ever had to deal with shitty code before? Anybody? <laughs> like, let's get real. Has anybody had to deal with that? Yes. Okay. Big show of hands. Um, have you written that shitty code before that somebody else has had to deal with? Neighbors are like looking at each other, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, so, okay, we've all written shitty code, right? I'm glad that you guys are really, really honest with me because part of my talk is about this. Um, sometimes we write bad code because it's, you know, we're on a time crunch and we just need to ship the package out the door. That's understandable, but sometimes we write bad code because we over-design we think about the problem too much. And we tend to really screw it up because we nerd out about what this thing can do and not what it should be doing, right? So I came up with this super scientific graph. Um, uh, there's a, I can give you the data if you want, but um, basically the, the more design effort we put into it, design effort's actually a very good thing, right? When we start looking at how we can better design our code, and thinking about the problem at hand and seeing how that thing can be simple and flexible, we, we get benefits from it. But we get to this point where we start seeing a really sharp fall off. Um, and that's because we're over designing or over architecting our code. We don't wanna be like this guy who's out in space and totally just looking down at his own universe that he created and admiring it because there's nobody else out there. And the reality is we're really, like we're building real software here. We're in the business of solving problems and it's usually solving problems with other people, right? With teams. So we need to better figure out how to communicate our code. So the title of this talk is called Building Better Packages, but really um, I called it that because it's about building or writing better code in Go. And in actuality, we should be writing uh, packages for almost all of our code in Go. Right? We should be thinking about how we can take this really lightweight abstraction that Go gives us called packages, looking at how to separate those concerns that we need to separate. So um, I want you guys to come in with just that perspective of uh, thinking that we should be solving these things as concepts and not necessarily uh, thinking about implementation. That gets to my next point, which is looking at the title of this talk, you may think I'm going to tell you guys how to write idiomatic Go, and that's, that's not the case for this talk today. We're gonna to be talking about interface instead of implementation. Um, because I think, especially with Go, when we have a really solid interface to begin with, a really good way for our packages and our libraries and our code to talk to each other, that the implementation becomes very, very straightforward. So um, with that assumption, implementation takes a back seat to interface in this talk. Um, my three main points are simplicity, flexibility, and continuity. And I think these make up the three pillars of what makes good packages. Simplicity being this singular focus. Flexibility uh, being able to withstand the test of time and change. And the last one, which is kind of the oddball, is continuity. And I'll explain a little bit more about that uh, later on in this talk. So let's start off with uh, simplicity. Um, obligatory Dijkstra quote, simplicity is prerequisite for reliability. Um, I definitely believe this is true, and I just wanted to point out that reliability is not just a, a single state inside of your, your code or your program. It's, um, it's more of this process. Uh, a lot of us are working um, with you know, cloud architectures, and we're working on living programs. So for something to be reliable also means it needs to be maintainable. And um, when defects do arise, we need to be able to have the code written in such a way where we can find and fix defects easily. Um, so in his talk, Simple Made Easy by Rich Hickey, which I definitely recommend anybody uh, who has not seen that talk, please watch it. It's a great talk, um, just talking about simplicity inside programming. And he, he goes over this um, concept of singularity within simple programs, saying that, um, Simple programs or processes have like one role, one task, one concept, one dimension. Um, and he draws all of these singular concepts around it, which I think are, are very, very good. But he also says it's not singular in every way. Like um, a simple program does not necessarily mean a single instance or one instance or a single routine. 
Um, so how do we discover things that are simple, or how do we discover that things are complex rather than simple? Um, just to start off with a little bit of a story, uh, a coworker came up to me the other day, and he said, I want to make sure and validate that we are continuing to build letter openers instead of Swiss Army knives. And this totally like blew my mind, because it's, it's correct. For us to really build the things that um, are simple and easy to maintain, um, especially in the long run, and especially when we're programming in the large, we need to hone in on really what that thing is supposed to be doing. Um, so if you're building a letter opener, you're supposed to be opening letters with it, not doing, oh, well, it could do this too, and it could do this too. So simplify, simplify, simplify with building letter openers instead of Swiss Army knives. Um, I like to ask myself three questions, especially in the open source world when I'm um, evaluating projects and pull requests and, and issues. Um, the first one is, what does it mean? So like, what does my project mean or my package? Um, do I have like a unified vision? Um, because when an when a issue comes in that says, oh, well, we should add this feature or we should go in this direction, if I don't have a solid foundation on what that package actually means, I'm not going to be able to answer or discern that answer correctly. Um, second of all, what does it accomplish? What is this package actually doing? Um, this also comes into play when somebody asks for a feature request or they ask for um, bug fixes, right? The perfect example is if somebody claims something is a bug, your answer to that is dependent on like, what is the spec for your program or for your package? So knowing what it's supposed to be accomplishing is extremely valuable when building simple programs. And lastly, and this goes um, especially with Go, is what does it have to offer? Um, especially with Go and third-party packages, when you're pulling down a third-party package, there's actually that cost to bringing that dependency into your program. And I think a lot of you guys as Go developers recognize that. So in building packages, you got to make sure it offers um, enough to justify the cost. Uh, an example of this for simplicity's sake is um, Negroni um, with just its API and its interface. Um, this is the entire interface for Negroni. And one thing I just wanted to point out is that it's, it's simple because it's going off of um, knowledge that people have previ previously have of net HTTP. It's not going above and beyond with, with newer abstractions. And by the way, if you guys don't know, Negroni is a, is a middleware chain um, for net HTTP handlers. But if anybody's familiar with net HTTP, you'll find a lot of this extremely, extremely um, simple and easy to follow. So the next thing I want to talk about is flexibility. Um, and when I'm talking about flexibility in this context, I'm talking about uh, programs and code that complement growth. Um, because we're, we're in the business of solving problems. When, um, when those problems change or those assumptions change, or we attempt to solve problems in different ways, our code needs to be malleable enough to um, work well with time and change. And the thing that gets me stoked out about Go is I just have this like deep-rooted feeling that the code that I'm writing is of course going to last so much longer than the code that I write in some other languages. For some reason, it just has that, um, that really cool uh, attribute about it. So the way Go expresses uh, flexibility is through interfaces. And um, the implicitness helps out a ton when it comes to figuring out how to design packages for flexibility. Um, the most ubiquitous interface is the IO writer interface. And the thing I love about this is it's just so simple and straightforward. A writer writes things, right? If you ever need to write something, you should probably have something to do with a writer in Go. And it's very, very straightforward. We have a lot of these tiny interfaces that make up this, uh, this beha behavioral hierarchy. Um, another one of my favorites, um, which is not as common, is the HTTP file system interface. And this one's really, really rad because it abstracts away the idea of like what medium your files are being stored on and just says, hey, give me a file of this name. And it returns to you a file. This way you can um, have you know, easier test cases and you can um, implement a file system in memory instead of on disk. Um, this makes flexibility very, very easy. So I get this question a lot. Um, people always say, well, 
So if interfaces are so good, we should always be using them, right? So I want to push back on that a little and say, well, you should mostly use interfaces. And then they ask me, OK, so, so when should I use an interface and when should I not? Um, well, if we observe what interfaces actually communicate, they communicate concreteness, communicate stability, and they communicate commitment. Right? When we put together an interface and release it out in the wild, we're now expecting people to implement that interface. We can't actually change uh, methods on that interface because that would break backwards compatibility. So we have to use discretion when it comes to um, deciding whether or not we want to use an interface or build an interface and use it within um, our APIs. So a couple of my rules of thumb that I use, and the, there's always exceptions to these, but um, this is generally my gut feeling when I come across a couple of these um, ideas, is when we have a return value, it generally should be a struct because we're not really getting that much value out of returning an interface type. Um, that struct, of course, could implement interfaces itself, but for extensibility purposes, unless you're really trying to hide the implementation, you want to return um, a struct. Uh, this is really, really good if um, things change and you need to provide more information to the users of your package. If the object is an argument value, then it's generally good to make that an interface because it's an input into your routine. And the more flexibility you can have on the inputs to your routine, the better. Um, the, on, the only exception, not only exception, but one of the exceptions to this is if um, your user is declaring um, some sort of struct within your, um, they're declaring some sort of struct that you know, acts as configuration or needs to be more extendable, then it makes more sense to pass a struct. An example of these rules is in um, the Buff.io package. When you're creating a new writer, um, you see we, we're following this same pattern. Um, and this is in the standard library, by the way. It's taking an IO writer as its input, which means you could pass in anything that implements that write method. And then um, it's passing back its own struct of a writer. And, and the decision was made on this because um, down the road, if there were going to be any package changes that required more information to be shown, they can pass back that struct. And this makes, um, this makes it really, really easy to remain flexible. So um, very decisive use of interfaces makes packages super, super flexible. Um, I also get asked a lot, so how do I discover interfaces? I know I need to use interfaces, and I know in what cases I should be using interfaces, but like, I still I don't have that intuition of how I can figure it out. And um, we need to start tuning our minds to look at behavioral dependencies within methods and what methods we're calling. And um, the reality of it is, we're, if we're passing structs around and we're not actually inspecting the data on that struct, then we're not really using the struct for what it's um, meant to be for. Uh, if we're just calling methods on that struct, then it's a pretty good indicator that we're going to need to use an interface instead. Um, the classic example is people, um, especially when they're starting with Go, are passing OS files around. Um, and in general, they're not really using any of those fields that are on the OS file struct. Instead, they're um, generally writing to the file. Um, and so in that case, you would want to use an IO writer instead of a file. Um, so that's flexibility. Um, both of these points, flexibility and simplicity, um, they're really, really um, embedded in this Go community, I feel. And um, I'm excited to see those concepts pushed forward a lot more in the future. This last one, it's kind of the oddball in the room, but is continuity. Um, I want to start off by painting a picture. Um, you guys ever been watching a movie or a TV show? This is especially apparent in cinema, where it's, uh, it's a scene of like two guys having a conversation. And in one scene, or in, in one shot, uh, one of the guys has their tie all straight, and then it cuts to the second guy, and then it cuts back to the, the original guy, and his tie is like in a completely different direction. It's all skewed, right? Um, this is known as breaking fictional continuity. It happens in cinema, movies, TV, and it also happens um, in literature as well. Um, a definition is uh, fictional continuity is the consistency of characteristics of persons, plot, objects, places, and events seen by the reader or the viewer. The part that's relevant to us is the consistency of objects seen by the reader. So when we try to paint that in the context of Go and programming, 
What we're essentially saying is we want to be continuous with the Go ecosystem. We want to be continuous with the existing third-party packages out there. We want to be continuous with the uh, standard library and what other Go developers are doing. We want to come together and be unified in decisions. This makes the Go community even stronger, and it makes the packages we come out with work even better together. So um, how do we write code that is continuous with the Go ecosystem? Um, I have three points on that. First one is to write code like a moron. Um, stop being clever about how you can write code. Uh, I, I see this a ton. Somebody's trying to do something completely outside of the box, and that's totally fun for a pet project, but when if your goal is to build up this Go community and write Go code idiomatically, um, sometimes it's okay to give up that power that you get or that empowerment that you get by kind of paving your own path. Um, so write code that's understandable. And that's not to say that you should forego design. I, I think designing good code and good interfaces is um, very apparent in Go. And, uh, we should continue to do stuff like that. But um, just embracing the Go ecosystem and, and being OK with not having to be so clever and just more straightforward. Um, secondly, write code like it already exists. Sometimes this requires stealing from people, uh, stealing <laughs> ideas and API designs and stuff like that that people are already familiar with, um, whether it's in the Go ecosystem or it may be somewhere else and it, it, it looks like it would fit well in the Go ecosystem. Um, but write code like somebody can look at it and be like, this feels natural. This feels good. Um, I get this all the time in a lot of my open source projects, and it's been, um, it's been a huge differentiator in a, a lot of the packages that I write compared to some others in the, um, in the Go space is when they feel like they've already been there, whether that's coming from a derivation of the standard library or, um, or uh, other concepts within the Go space. Um, the, the third point is write code like it's a part of the standard library. Um, and an example of that is Gorilla Mux. I love this package. And mainly because it has a lot of cool features and functionality. That's great. But this little bit right here, this, these functions on the package are exactly the same as HTTP serve Mux. So you go from this gradual, like, OK, I'm using serve Mux, but now I need a little more power. I can go to Gorilla Mux now. And you don't have to change any of your code. And that's really, really cool. And I find that very powerful to bring that familiarity back into your packages. So if you need more examples, I just want to encourage you guys to dig into the standard library. Um, this is the best place to start. Go read the docs. Go read the source. Because the Go standard library is very, very straightforward. When you could just read it from top to bottom and be like, OK, I know what's going on. This is awesome. Um, that's the best way you can. Uh, Think, or that's the, best, that's the best thing you can do when you want to learn how to write idiomatic Go code. And after that, go extend it. So we've um, gotten to the end. I just want to do a little recap. Um, building better packages is about building code that's simple, flexible, and continuous. Um, simplicity meaning singular focus. Flexibility, being able to withstand time and change. And continuity, having that unshakable sense of existence. So I want to close you guys off with a quote by uh, the British author C.S. Lewis when he's talking about, um, it, it's in his 1937 review of J.R.R. Tolkien's The Hobbit. And he talks about Middle Earth as um, a world that seems to have been going on before we stumbled into it, but which, once found by the right reader, becomes indispensable to him. So if we could write code that is flexible, simple, and continuous, we can write code that's indispensable to the Go community. Thank you very much.